Well, good morning, everyone. Greetings to you, GYC and ASI Europe. It's a privilege to be with you. Uh, I've been given the task of presenting on the topic of prayer over the course of these mornings that we have together in our short sessions. And we're going to begin uh, these topics by addressing the keys to unanswered prayer. Uh, generally, people give presentations on things that would make you think that this is what leads to your prayers being answered. I'd like to kind of start with some of the problems that lead to our prayers not being answered. And then from there, we're going to go through a process of addressing uh, key principles to finding power in your prayer life. So I'd like to begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll begin our message this morning. Let's pray. God in heaven, thank you for this privilege to come into your presence. Thank you that I believe you have a blessing in store for us over the course of this week together. And I'm just asking that you would give me clarity of mind. I pray that what is shared would be uh, simple, uh, that it would be Christ-centered, and that it would be practical, and that you would help us to better understand some hindrances uh, that keep our prayer lives from being everything that you would wish for them to be. So we love you, Lord, and we thank you, and we ask for your presence in an even greater measure in these moments we have together just now. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So turn with me to the book of Exodus, chapter 6. We're going to begin in the book of Exodus. And I think there's some really powerful lessons for us here. I was studying this a couple years ago, I guess about a year and a half ago, and just saw some really, really interesting principles that I think hinder a lot of us when it comes to our experience with God, and particularly in our experience in prayer. So in Exodus chapter 6, beginning of verse 1, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand he will let them go, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. And God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, Lord, I was not known to them. I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage in which they were strangers. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I'll bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you as a heritage. I am the Lord. Right? I'm reaffirming to you that these promises I've made to you, I'm going to do because I am the Lord. So Moses spoke thus to the children of Israel. And you would assume this would be pretty encouraging, right? If God himself is putting his name on the table and saying, this is the evidence that I will do what I've said to you, you would assume the people would rejoice, right? And say, hallelujah, thank you, Lord. But that's not how they respond in verse 9. So Moses spoke thus to the children of Israel, but they did not heed Moses because of anguish of spirit and cruel bondage. This can happen to us, right? They didn't listen to God's amazing promise of deliverance because of anguish of spirits and cruel bondage by the Egyptians. When we go through hardships and challenges and difficulties and, and, and seasons of oppression, it can rob us of living faith. It can cause us to hear promises from God that sound gorgeous, but in the back of our mind, we think to ourselves, nah, that, that couldn't happen for me. Yeah, that, 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 there's no way that would happen in my life. And our pain, our wounds from our past can drown out the voice of God and convince us that we don't deserve His blessings or even that they are impossible, right? Now, without faith... It, it's going to hinder, right, this experience. You know, without faith, it's impossible to please God, we're told. But skip over a little bit. Go to Exodus chapter 14 now. Exodus chapter 14, verses 10 to 18. But uh, you may just want to, like, when you're watching this later, just hit pause and stew on that first theme because that one hit me pretty hard and, and it rocked me for quite a while because it's, we're so prone to this and our discouragement to allow our current circumstances and disappointments to rob us of living faith in the here and now. And so we're no longer praying in faith. We're praying out of like, I probably should, I ought to, but I really don't expect God to do big things in my life. And so in turn, we receive not because we ask not. 
And if we do ask, we ask amiss, and we're not asking in faith. But go to Exodus chapter 14, and we see another circumstance here. Exodus chapter 14, and beginning of verse 10. Exodus chapter 14 and verse 10 says, And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they now left the land of Egypt. They've gotten to the edge of the Red Sea. The pillar of cloud and pillar of fire has led them in this right direction. But now when they get to this, you know, impassable border of this body of water, they now look behind them and recognize that all of the Egyptian army is coming after them, and it scares them to death. Okay? And so they cry out to Moses. They were afraid. And the children of Israel cried out to Moses. And they said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians that we should die, than that we should die in the wilderness. Can you imagine? God's people who were promised the land of Canaan and are now being delivered by a supernatural hand that has sacked Egypt with plagues. And they're now saying, I would rather be back in Egypt in servitude than to take the risk of dying out here in the wilderness, even though a miracle is what's leading the way, that pillar of fire or that pillar of cloud. And so it's a pretty heartbreaking to Moses as a leader. So verse 13, he tries to encourage them. And Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. Right? Moses is trying by, by exhibiting this powerful faith to awaken faith in the nation of Israel. Just stand still and you will see the salvation of the Lord that God's going to do for you today. And you will never see this hindrance ever again. This, this enemy force, you'll never see them again. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. But then in verse 15, God says, why do you cry out to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. But lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they shall follow them. So I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, his chariots and his horsemen. Then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I've gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. Now let's skip over to verse 21. Then it says that Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. So Moses is saying, sit still and watch the salvation of the Lord. And God says, why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to go. Move out in faith. And it happens. He's strong. An east wind comes and separates the water that night and, and leaves a path of dry ground as the waters are divided. Then verse 22, So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, and the waters were a wall to them, on their right hand and on their left, and the Egyptians pursued and went after them into the midst of the sea. All Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And now it came to pass in the morning watch that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud, and he troubled the army of the Egyptians. And he took off their chariot wheels, so they drove them with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Even the enemies of God recognize that God is fighting for the people of Israel. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians, on their chariots and on their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Then the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them, and not so much as one of them remained. The very promise that was given that not one of these Egyptians will you ever see again, God has just now brought that to pass, and not one of them survived. Now, the children of Israel had walked on dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. 
Thus, the Lord, uh, thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and they believed the Lord and his servant Moses. But you know, some of us can be like Israel was in that circumstance. We're so afraid to hope. We've dealt with so many discouragements, so many disappointments. You know, I tried to step out in faith and God didn't do what I thought he would do. And we're just afraid to hope anymore. And we're telling God that it would be easier for us to just remain in Egypt, to remain in bondage, right? And to remain in this difficulty because things aren't going to change. And it's not worth believing that anything good can happen in this area of my life anymore. But God is calling you this morning to go forward, to believe what he has said and to take him at his word. And when we step out in faith, God does powerful miracles. Now, Egypt represents unbelief in scripture. We see this in Daniel 11. We also see this in other places that Egypt is a symbol of unbelief. And so many of us would rather remain in our state of unbelief because at least we know what to expect and we don't have to have the fearful expectation of being hurt or disappointed again. I had a conversation with a very good friend of mine. Someone is actually uh, one of the large reasons why I became a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. They're no longer a Christian, but I I ran into them uh, in a public place while I was traveling and had a very good cordial interaction with them. And we're, we're close. So like we can still talk about, you know, the way that things, you know, how I'm a Christian and they're not, you know, really a, a believing Christian anymore. I think they kind of ascribe to being a theist of sorts. But I just told them, you know, I really wrestle with what's so attractive about naturalism and about atheism because it completely denies the intrinsic moral value of a human being. And all of us want to know that our life has significance, that we are loved, that we are valued, that there's a purpose for being. All of us want that. So I don't see what's so attractive about this belief system. And the response this person gave me was so unexpected. They said, what makes it so attractive is that I don't have to get my hopes up anymore only to be disappointed. Right, this Egyptian unbelief mindset that I'm fully convinced that many people this day in this in this time are not atheists because of scientific reasons, but based upon experiential reasons and bad examples from people who claim to know God. And so in this circumstance, it just broke my heart to hear this from a dear friend of mine that they just got tired of hoping and being disappointed. And that's where Israel was. And maybe that's where you are, but that's not what God is wanting for you. God wants us to pray in faith, to pray in boldness, right? To come boldly before his throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in a time of need. That's what God wants from us. And if a father is willing to give precious gifts to his children, how much more will a father in heaven give spiritual gifts to his children, right? And other gifts to his children in answer to their prayers. So God is calling us to believe that he loves us and that he longs to bless us. God needs that from us today. So we're looking at keys to unanswered prayer. That's a big one. Fear and unbelief. We're told in Romans chapter 5 and verse 5 that hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has given to us. In Romans 15, 13, it says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing and that you may abound in hope by the power of his Holy Spirit. So God wants us to be people who are filled with hope, filled with belief, filled with expectancy. Now, we're we're not talking about this prosperity gospel of name it, claim it. That's not what we're saying here. But the point is there is a very real component to prayer that involves faith, expectancy, and hope. And if we allow the circumstances and disappointments of life to rob us of that, it will directly and negatively impact our prayer lives. Keys to unanswered prayer. God wants you to hope, and that's why he's called the God of hope. It's Satan that wants you to lose hope because he knows that a prayer of faith in God's promises, if we do that, we'll never see them. If we don't pray God's promises, we'll never see them come to pass, and we'll continue to live in a discouraged state. And I'm fully of the mind that if Satan can't deceive you, he'll discourage you. So yeah, you may, you may believe this beautiful message of present truth, and you may have a you know, good understanding in the investigative judgment, the sanctuary, and the, Sabbath, the, the Sabbath, and the state of the dead, and all this stuff. But if you're too discouraged to even believe that God loves you and wants to bless you, Satan still wins. He still wins. 
And that's not the way that God wants it to look for us. So when we take that step of faith and go forward and see God provide, this lays our unbelief in the dust, right? And it strengthens our faith. It gives us courage for future battles. In the last verse of Exodus chapter 14 says that the people feared the Lord and they believed his servant Moses. After seeing an undeniable miracle, it led them to believe, right? So when we take these risks and we believe, it ends up giving us more faith and more courage in future circumstances. And that's what God's wanting to do, right? God is wanting to build a resume in your life right, of answered prayers, of blessings, of His care, of His love, His providence, His intervention in your life, so that when you're down and out and you're hurting, you know the best person for this job is the one who was here when I needed him the last time, and the time before that, and the time before that. But if you allow Satan to eclipse God's goodness with the moments of discouragement and disappointment, and to cause you to think that God isn't there and God doesn't care, it will rob us of future blessings, not just the blessings in the here and now, okay? So fear is so debilitating to faith. In fact, it's an act of unbelief. Fear itself is an act of unbelief. Go to 1 John chapter 4. Fear is a healthy emotion in the context of being, you know, chased by a bear or, you know, circumstances like this. But fear should not be the thing that runs and overruns our spiritual experience. There's a big difference, right, between a functional fear that saves your life and something that deprives you of peace and joy and confidence and faith in the here and now. But in 1 John chapter 4, speaking of that abject fear that destroys our faith, it says this, 1 John 4 and verse 16, it says that we have no and believe the love that God has for us. And God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Okay, so God is wanting us to not just intellectually assent or ascribe to the idea that he may love us. God wants us to experientially know and believe that he loves, yes, even you. Then in verse 18, it says, there is how much fear in love? No fear in love, but that perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Then it says that we love him. Why? Because he first loved us. No one is going to find a love for God in their hearts until they first encounter the love of God for them. No one is going to find themselves falling in love with God until they come to encounter the beautiful reality of the fact that God is already in love with you. And when we encounter this goodness of God, this love of God, this is what casts out all of our fear. This perfect love of God towards unperfect, imperfect fallen beings, right? It drives out that fear. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7 says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And if you think it through, it's not just saying that fear, you know, that God didn't give you a spirit of fear, but power, love, and sound mind. That implies that fear robs us of love, the ability to love and be loved by God and others. It robs us of the ability you know, of power, right? To be able to just have power to do what God would have for us to do. And it robs us of the ability to make sound decisions, right? God has given us a spirit, not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind, which means that fear adversely affects each of those things. And he doesn't want this in your experience. The Israelites were denied access to Canaan because of fear and unbelief. They could not enter into the promised land. Their wanderings in the wilderness were totally unnecessary. And God didn't want it for them. He wanted them to go in. So I don't know what you're afraid of, you know, what risk you're afraid of taking this morning, what promise you feel unworthy of receiving, or what else you may be holding back. But Jesus is asking you to surrender that fear and that unbelief to him this morning and to allow him to bless you beyond what you feel that you deserve and to set you free from that tyranny of fear and unbelief and hopelessness. Again, talking about keys to unanswered prayer. And I've had this. I, I, I can so relate to the nation of Israel in our first two texts in Exodus on, you know, like I would rather stay in Egypt and know what to expect then I have to get my hopes up and be disappointed because some of us, we've had certain areas of our life that no matter what we do or what we choose to believe, it just seems to not go as we would hope. And it's very difficult, right, to, to be naked before God and hope again, to put myself out there, to be vulnerable again. It can be scary. It can be challenging for us. And I went through that in a certain area of my life. And I just thought, 
You know, I just couldn't see anything good in store for myself in this particular area. And then God brought me face to face with something that was exceedingly above anything I could ask or think in that area of my life. And I just thought like, no way. Like, there's no way this is going to happen. And I kept trying to think of ways to convince myself and affirm my own unbelief. It'll never happen. I don't deserve it. I'm not good enough. You fill in the blanks. Because I had had some pretty difficult and discouraging experiences in that area of my life heretofore. And it was just, it robbed me of living faith in the here and now. But God was just tenacious with me. He wouldn't let me give up. He wouldn't let me run. He wouldn't let me explain my way out of it. No matter what I tried to do or believe, God was tenacious in pursuing me and convicting me. And it literally was if God was telling me, I'm not going to let you go unless you let me bless you. Right? You think of jo- Joseph in the book of Genesis where you know, he grabs hold of God and just in desperation says, look, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. It literally was if God was just wrestling with me and telling me, I'm not going to let you go until you let me bless you. And through a series of circumstances, he had to he'd bring me face to face with my unbelief, my, my unfounded fears, my hopelessness. And I couldn't argue with the reality that was happening before my very eyes and the ways in which God was speaking to me. And I found myself finally submitting. And it was a scary time for me. And you think this, that just sounds so ludicrous. Like, why would you be afraid to be blessed by God? Shame, rejection, frustration, failure, right? Like the the difficulties of life can lead us to adopt thoughts that are just unreasonable. There's a text in in, in the wisdom literature, I forget it's in Proverbs or Ecclesiastes, where it says, surely oppression destroys a wise man's reason, right? The difficulties of life and the oppression that we've gone through can literally cause someone who is wise, someone who's intelligent, it can mess with their ability to reason. And so disappointment, discouragement, and all of that stuff can actually lead us to adopting worldviews that are totally irrational, even though we may be largely rational people. And so God may be speaking to you this morning and just letting you know, hey, yeah, some stuff has happened. Life has been difficult for you. Life has had its challenges that you didn't see coming and didn't ask for. But God is telling you today, don't let that rob you of living faith. I'm asking you to believe what I tell you in my word. So I want to close with this in Psalm chapter 34 and verse 4. Psalm chapter 34 and verse 4. This beautiful, beautiful promise uh, that I I claim uh, when I'm in these moments. This is King David speaking. Psalm 34 and verse 4. It says, I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from all my fears. Guys, you can do that today. I don't know what your story is. I don't know what you've gone through. But what I do know is whatever has filled you with fear and robbed you of living faith, that can change today. We can cry out to God. God will hear our prayer and he will send help from his sanctuary to set us free. That's what he wants. If he's the God of hope, that must be implying that he wants you to view him as someone that you can hope in. Someone who's trustworthy. Notice, he's not just a God who happens to supply hope. He's the God of hope. He's the very source of your hope. And so if you even find yourself completely hopeless, you can come boldly to his throne of grace and say, God, would you give me hope to believe what you're telling me? Because the pain of my past and the wounds of my past are really causing me to doubt whether you could really do this for me right now. Would you give me hope? from that living stream that flows from your throne. Would you do that for me today? You think God would do that? Absolutely. So again, we've been addressing some keys to unanswered prayer, fear and unbelief and hopelessness can absolutely sabotage our experience with God and rob us of living faith, which in turn dramatically and negatively impacts our prayer lives. We'll unpack some more Um, keys to unanswered prayer in our next session together. But I hope and pray this has been helpful for you because this was a game changer for me, especially those texts in Exodus. I can so relate that I I don't even want to hear what God says because of cruel bondage and difficulties in my life. And God is asking us, hey, 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 step out in faith. Why, you know, even whenever we say, okay, God, like, you know, let's, we're we're, we're hoping something's going to happen here. Even then he's telling us, why are you crying out to me? 
Step out in faith and trust and believe that I will lead you, I will guide you, I will provide for you and sustain you. And I can tell you from my own personal testimony that God, once God got me past these barriers that had come into my experience, I have seen God do something literally supernatural in my own personal experience of growing and reviving my faith. I feel more happy and a whole and at peace than I've ever felt in my life. And it came by me choosing to trust God when things didn't make sense. It came from me trusting God and claiming His promises when I had been hurt in a lot of different ways. And I just took that step of faith that uh, Ellen White says in one place, that you can, if you want to please God, you can do so by believing His promises. And so I started bringing promises before him, and we'll talk about this later in the series. But I started bringing those promises before him day after day after day, and God has used this process to revive living faith in my own experience and to literally raise my faith experience and my prayer life from the dead. It has been dramatic and life-changing, and I'm so thankful for that. So as we close now and with a word of prayer, I just want you to, to be honest with God and just ask Him, Lord, are there things in my own heart, in my own experience that are keeping me from grabbing hold of your promises and of your throne and believing the things about me that you believe about me and believing the things about you that I used to believe, but just the things of life just kind of hurt me and, and, and robbed me of that. As we pray, just ask God to revive that living faith and that hope and, and to give you the ability to believe in faith. So let's pray. God, you know what people have gone through who are watching this right now and are listening to it later. And Lord, some of the things that have been done to us are absolutely unacceptable. And they have challenged us. They have robbed us of living faith. Lord, they have really crippled our faith experience. And I'm just praying that we would not be like the nation of Israel, that through cruel bondage and hardship have lost faith. Lord, I pray that in those down and out difficult moments, we would find ourselves doubling down on the God of hope. Coming to you boldly, coming to your throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. God, would you do that for us today? Would you revive living faith in our experience? And Lord, I pray that we would find ourselves taking you at your word once more and believing and thriving. Lord, as, as the disciples asked Jesus when he was on earth, Lord, teach us to pray. As John taught his disciples, Lord, would you teach us? So Lord, show us the things that are a hindrance to our prayer lives, and then show us the keys to seeing answers to our prayer lives, and they can bring power and revival into our experience and our time in the remaining sessions together. This is our plea today, Lord, and we ask this now in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.